Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. This one, I'm going to do a bit of a classic today, the Loch Ness Monster. What happens here if you're new? Uh, a writer today, Ilza, has written me a script, the Loch Ness Monster. She's literally titled it, Need We Say More? I'm like, yeah, on a channel called Decoding the Unknown. I mean, this is one of the old classics. Uh, spoiler alerts, I've actually made a video about this before. Uh, it was years ago, but something really stuck with me. And it's like, Loch Ness Monster's probably not real. <laughs> It's like, look, technology's come a long way. Just because some dude back in the day said he saw a monster doesn't mean there is actually a monster. But as always, one of these days, I do look forward to being like, okay, yeah, I believe in that. I mean, we've had a couple where it's like that doesn't, like, I've entered it with uh, complete skepticism and come around to being like, yeah, that, that, that could be real. I mean, it's never happened with ghosts, obviously, because they're not real. But I mean, I, I do believe that there could be like, you know, I mean, we discover maybe not in like Scottish lakes, but in the depths of the ocean we've discovered some crazy shit. like didn't people think that giant squid giant squid was just a legend for years and didn't they recently find a giant squid and we're like holy shit. it's real it's real because the ocean's really big and i get the loch ness is really deep but it's not as deep as like that fucking, uh, mariana trench or whatever that shit is it goes down like deeper than everest is high which is crazy that's true right i feel like that's true time to fact check myself right now What's Everest? Like about 30,000 feet? Mariana Trench Depth. 11,000 meters, 36,000 feet. Yeah. So Everest height. Oh my god. The Mariana Trench is like 3,000 or 2,000 uh, meters deeper than Everest is high. That is insane. And James Cameron's been down there, which is weird, isn't it? Anyway, sorry, enough uh, enough faffing around. I've never read this before. We're going to explore it together. Let's get into it. Thank you, iPad, for that brilliantly timed notification. <laughs> Quiet. Trying to do a job here. Ah, what did I just say? I just turned you onto quiet. Airplane mode, bitch. Stories of the Loch Ness Monster, or Nessie, as she is more fondly known, go all the way back to some of Scotland's earliest inhabitants, the Picts. Since then, the monster has been seen by both locals and tourists, scientific explorations have been launched, and every sighting with various degrees of credibility is recorded by the official Loch Ness Monster Sightings Register. Sounds like a lot of people wasting their time right there. Monster of the deep or mass hallucination. Protector of the lock or money-making gimmick targeting hapless tourists. Whether you've seen her or not, whether you believe in her or not, Nessie has become as much a part of the Scottish Highlands as kilts, haggis, and bagpipes. Now, before we dive into the lock to find Nessie, uh, uh, I do need to ask our viewers to bear with me. Should we get a little sentimental? You see, Nessie was where it all started for me. My interest in mysteries, the desire to travel, and the excuse to spend the better part of my life making up stories <laughs> like this. So I have a deep fondness for the antisocial monster in a lake far off in Scotland. Do I think Nessie exists? Well, since this channel is for skeptics, I'll keep that to myself. But this channel's not for skeptics. I just happen to be a skeptic, and I would like to... I I, I guess I am pretty skeptical, but I would also love to be proven wrong, as I always say. What? I'll tell you the story, and you can make up your own mind. Loch Ness. As far as locks go, Nessie picked her lock with care. While Loch Ness is not the deepest lock, that honor goes to Loch Marah. It's the biggest lock by volume in Scotland. It's 22 square miles with an official depth of 754 feet. That's 230 meters for the rest of us. However, a local skipper, Keith Stewart, claims that he found the deepest part of the lock to be 889 feet or 270.9 meters. The depth and darkness of the lock have played a big role in keeping the mystery alive. Due to the high peak content in the water, it's nearly impossible to see much deeper than the surface. A deep, dark lock. What more could a monster ask for? You have to say, like, 300 meters down, or what was it, the official one? 230 meters? 754 feet? That's pretty goddamn deep. But then you compare it to the Mariana Trench, and it's like, how far does that shit go down? 11,000 meters? Good lord. Now I can describe Loch Ness, rolling green hills, an icy blue loch, a dark castle ruin. But that's a bit mediocre. Instead, how about the first impression of Loch Ness from someone who comes from a country of abundant sun and limited water? Ilza, I believe, is from South Africa. Winter in the Scottish Highlands was a bit of a shock on the system. It was wet, so very cold, and so damn green. We also have green spots in South Africa. There we go, I was right. But nothing like that. I grew up next to one of the bigger dams in the country, so a large body of water practically on my doorstep. I'm used to that. Monsters in the 
Damn, well, that's the story better suited to one of the other channels. Despite all of this, I was not prepared for Loch Ness. The sheer size of it was astonishing. We visited a uh, quart. Maybe, I'm sorry, Scottish people. I'm not going to look it up because then it breaks my flow. And I know you're going to be like, Simon, you looked up the depth of the Mariana Trench. And it's like, yeah, 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 but I was interested in that, wasn't I? That looked out on the deepest part of the loch. The waters of the loch is not just dark, it's the color of the night sky and the Kalahari. The sky was overcast, not unusual, shocking green everywhere I looked, and the ruins of an old castle sacked by the MacDonald clan multiple times in its long history. It was a scene straight from Jane Eyre. If Nessie had suddenly decided to entertain the crowd with a backflip, I wouldn't have been in the least bit surprised. I'm a bit of a skeptic when it comes to cryptozoology. But in the moment, I wasn't so sure. It's like, yeah, you can get swept up. It's like, I don't believe in ghosts at all, as we've discussed many times, even in this very episode. But it's like, if I'm at home alone and there's like creaking in the attic, I'm like, ah! But I'm not like it's ghosts. I'm probably like it's murderers. Which I mean also statistically very unlikely but much more likely than ghosts. So again, no, no ghosts. The first sighting. The story of Loch Ness Monster goes back a long way. The earliest record of something in the loch is a stone carving of an unknown animal left behind by the Picts. The Picts, called by some the lost people of Europe, are a bit of a mystery themselves. An ancient people living in eastern and northeastern Scotland around the time of the Romans, very little is actually known about them, and they seem to have disappeared around the first millennium AD, probably incorporated into the Gaelic cultures. The one thing they left behind is a wealth of carving stones, a topic of archaeological study to this day, <laughs> and allegedly a giant monster. But it's like, where did they get the giant monster from? Like, did they get a circus as a little newt and they put it in the lake and then it became a giant monster? No. The ancient carving in question was built into a highland farm building not far from Loch Ness. It depicts an unidentified aquatic creature described as a swimming elephant or perhaps a horizontal seahorse. Essentially, it does flip as a curled tail and an elongated beak or trunk. The carving stones mostly depict recognizable animals such as snakes, ravens, and wild boar, but the Pictish beast is the one animal that's not yet been fully identified. There have been a few attempts at an explanation. Some consider the possibility that the beast is a dolphin or a porpoise. I found one suggestion that it might, in fact, be a swimming elephant, though what an elephant will be doing swimming in Loch Ness in the heyday of the Picts is a mystery all on its own. Wait, wouldn't a dolphin also be a mystery? Like, if I was in Scotland and there was some, like, dolphin doing some flip in that lake, I'd be like, what? what? Why is there a dolphin in there? Shit. How did it get in there? Don't they like the sea? Wait, do dolphins like the sea? Yeah, they like the sea. What am I talking about? Of course, it could also be a depiction of the Kelpie or water horse creatures from Celtic legend. Regardless, archaeologists and historians consider Urquhart on the shores of Loch Ness to be the site of a Pictish settlement of some significance, so they would have had a great view of the loch and its inhabitants, be they seahorses, Kelpies, swimming elephants, or sea monsters. The first written account of a meeting with the Loch Ness monster happened around 565 AD, and it comes from the biography of St. Columba. On a mission to Scotland to convert as many heathenish Picts to Christianity as possible, the good saint found himself on the shores of the river Ness that flows from Loch Ness, pondering how to get to the other side. Walking along the shore, he came upon a group of Picts burying a friend who had just been killed by a water beast. This is the only time the monster appears to have killed anyone. St. Columba laid his staff across the dead man's chest, and lo and behold, he came back to life. It's a miracle, and just a legend. Still wanting to get to the other side, St. Columba ordered brother Lugni Mokimin to swim across the river and bring back a boat moored on the opposite shore. Not to criticize a saint, but seeing as he just brought a man back from the dead that had been killed by a water beast, this seems a little bit short-sighted. Also, if you can bring someone back from the dead, just be like, huzzah, and I have magic to bridge. Regardless, the monk leapt into the waters and started swimming to the other side. The monster alerted to the man's, oh, yeah, dude. What did you think was going to happen? It's like, oh, he's been kissed. Why? He came roaring to the surface, going for the monk with the enthusiasm expected of a hungry water beast. St. Columba stepped forward, made the sign of the cross, invoked the name of the Lord, and commanded the beast to leave the monk alone. The monster then destroyed the monk. No, not really. Of course this worked, because it's a fictional story. The monster either fled in terror at the saint's power, or simply decided to avoid all the unnecessary shouting and find an easier meal elsewhere. The Picts, upon seeing the monster obey the saint, fell to their knees and converted to Christianity on the spot. Easy. They'll just give up all of their previous beliefs. It's really easy to just get people to give up a lifetime of belief and convert to your new thing. I mean, cults manage it somehow, don't they? Which is pretty crazy. So never mind, I completely believe everything. I 
made your mouth. These are not the only sightings. There are quite a few more before we reach the 1900s, when the great sensation that was the Loch Ness Monster finally hit the tabloids. A Scottish chronicler mentions sightings of a monster in the loch around 1520. In 1694, Richard Fragg writes about a floating island spotted in Loch Ness. However, there are no floating islands in Loch Ness, so we have to wonder... What did he see? A writer called Daniel Defoe mentions Leviathans in Loch Ness that were disturbed by General Wade's men blasting a road in 1726. In the 1800s, there were several sightings of monsters or just strange things in the loch. However, the 1800s were a busy time for Nessie as she was not just seen in the water, but on the shores and roads around the loch. Descriptions during this time vary wildly, everything from a serpentine animal to something resembling a sturgeon to an animal with tusks and even one that barks. Apparently, Nessie was experiencing a bit of an identity crisis at this time or alternatively and i do realize this is totally just the skeptic show but uh alternatively they didn't get their story straight however there are a few descriptions that seem in line with what we have today large in size humps a long neck and darkly colored considering the sheer number of people who claim to have seen something i have to wonder if not a monster was there something particular peculiar floating around loch ness nessie hits the charts the Nessie phenomenon really took off in the 1930s. In April 1933, according to an Inverness Courier article published in May, a well-known local businessman and his wife, a university graduate living near Inverness, were traveling along the north shore of Loch Ness when they spotted a disturbance in the loch less than a mile from the shore. I like that they throw in a local businessman and his wife, a university graduate. It's like, okay. <laughs> Simon Whistler, university graduate. Pleasure to meet you. <laughs> People think you're such a belle. Hello. Yes. University graduate. Mm-hmm. Jolly good. The creature's body resembled that of a whale, and it was rolling and plunging, generally having a jolly good time, water cascading from its enormous size. When taking the final plunge back into the depths of the loch, the waves were big enough to have been caused by a passing steamer. The couple waited for about half an hour to see if the creature would surface again, but nothing reappeared. The creature was gone, and the legend of Nessie was introduced to the world at large. And in the last 89 years or so, hundreds of sightings have been reported. Considering all these sightings, there has to be something in the water, right? Gary Campbell is convinced, and his wife Kathy runs the Loch Ness Sightings Register, where anyone who spots Nessie can register their sighting. Not every sighting is simply accepted at face value. Some sightings can be easily explained. For example, logs in the wake of a boat, and there are some obvious fakes. So only about a third of the actual sightings make it onto the registry. All in all, the registry currently has 1,136 sightings recorded up to date. In 2021, there were five sightings from the loch and 10 webcam images reported. So, despite what science has to say on the matter, Nessie fever is still growing strong, which is a kind of amazing to me because it's like, yo, the general consensus, as far as I'm aware, is that either there is no consensus or Nessie is not real. And if there was some photo in the last hundred years, like there's cameras, there's like webcams, there's security cameras, there's people, Loch Ness is a famous place. There must be people with cameras there all the time. And yet no photo has emerged, which is 100%, oh my God, yes. There is clearly a monster in there, and it's real. Not a single one, as far as I'm aware. Let's see if I'm wrong. But that's just the thing. It's like, yo, show me one photo, one convincing photo, and I will be convinced. But until then, it's all circumstantial. More eyewitness accounts. And oh, ignore any eyewitness account. If there's no photo, if it's just someone saying like, I saw a monster, just ignore them. That's like people saying, I saw a ghost. You can ignore them. Even if you saw a ghost yourself, Always remember to ignore yourself and then go out and buy a carbon monoxide detector. Where's the ignore button? How do I ignore? In 1979, Alistair Boyd, an art teacher, and his wife had their own Nessie encounter. <laughs> Allegedly. Boyd claims that as an art teacher, his job is to teach people to observe, and what he saw in the lock that day was not a log, an otter, or the wake of a boat. It was a large animal heaving out of the water, similar to a whale. According to him, the observable part of the animal when it stopped rolling was around 20 feet or 6 meters. This account is similar to many others reported from the 1930s up to the present day. We're not going to go through all of them or we'll be here until tomorrow, but what is interesting is that many of them describe similar features. Well, I mean, I don't want to... It's like, yes, because I know what the Loch Ness Monster looks like. Because every, you know, you've heard all these descriptions. We've been through it today. Now, if you went to Loch Ness and you saw a monster, you know, or you think you did, you're going to ascribe to it the things that you think it has because 
you're aware of what the Loch Ness Monster should be. Like, if someone says, look for, what's that? It's like confirmation bias. According to most accounts, the creature is either black or a very dark color. One person described it as sludgy brown or dark green. There were some accounts describing Nessie as light brown like a camel, but considering that this Nessie was seen on land and possibly barking at the time, I think we can safely ignore the camel-colored Nessie. Wait, that actually made it into the registry. Things that bark. Um, gonna say dogs. Things that are brown. Yep, potentially dogs. <laughs> Six meters long, no, but that wasn't this person. Now, the skeptics in the audience might say all marine animals are black or dark brown. Um, have you heard about the dolphin? <laughs> I mean, a lot of, it's kind of like that, you know, it's that sludgy dark green, like that carpy color. It doesn't prove there is a monster in the lake, that's true. But if all marine animals are black or dark brown, oh, why would Nessie be any different? All accounts agree that Nessie is big. In fact, a word that gets tossed around a lot in Nessie circles is whale, and some descriptions of Nessie resembling a whale go back to the 1930s. Apparently, Nessie is also a rather fun-loving monster. Plenty of witnesses say the monster reminded them of a whale rolling around in the water causing waves. If you also mention water looking like it was boiling. That would make sense with the blowhole being like <laughs> blowing, I guess, would be the word there rather than just making noise with your mouth, Simon. Good job. Now, once again, the skeptics out there would say that, of course, everyone describes the same thing. They're all reading the same bloody books. While that might explain all the recent sightings, it's the age of the internet, so nothing is really secret or mysterious anymore, it doesn't explain, explain the original sightings in the 1930s. After all, there were no books or delightful videos presented by the spectacled gentleman on the Loch Ness Monster back then. No, but there were rumors and people talking to each other, and it's like, oh, I'm going on holiday to Scotland, I'm going to go to this Scottish pub and have a jolly good pint. And then you're like having a pint, and the person, you know, the person's like, oh, let me tell you, why am I doing a pirate voice? How do Scottish people speak? Oh my god, I can't remember. Scottish? A bit of a Scottish accent? No, oh, that's Irish. Oh my god, I'm so bad at accents. Look, imagine a Scottish person telling you about the Loch Ness Monster, and then you go out, you know, if you're walking home from the pub, you're a little bit blotto, and you're like, oh, look, it's a monster. Ah, and it's exactly like, you know, oh, all right, all right. I, I do think there are explanations for the sightings in the 1930s. Hoaxes are plenty. No story about Nessie would be complete without the hoaxes, and there are many. One man in particular seemed to be in the eye of the storm. The first hoax happened in December 1933. The Daily Mail commissioned Marmaduke Wetherill, a self-assured big game hunter and filmmaker, to hunt down and find proof of a monster causing a ruckus in the Highlands. This guy sounds like a legend. <laughs> it's like, can you imagine? He sounds like a British version of Teddy Roosevelt. He's a big game hunter. He's a filmmaker. He's hunting monsters. And his name is Marmaduke, which is equal parts cool and equal parts dorky somehow. Marmaduke, the name should make a comeback. He returned to London with footprint casts to what he considered to be a very powerful, soft-footed animal about 20 feet or 6 meters long. However, after being checked thoroughly, zoologists at the Natural History Museum found that the footprints were those a soft-footed animal, right, but not a monster, rather a hippopotamus, similar to one Wetherill that shot in Africa. Since there are no hippos in Loch Ness or the surrounding area, the tracks were obviously faked. Oh, come on, Marmaduke, you could do better. Come on! Now, some sources claim that Wetherill was the one who faked the prince himself, while other sources seem unsure of the exact role of Wetherill in the deception. Did he fake the prince himself to prove his prowess after realizing what a near impossible task it would be to find Nessie, or did someone else wish to take him down a notch and play a prank on him? Either way, the bluff was called, the hippo revealed, and Wetherill returned to London in disgrace. I mean, if someone wanted to shame him or like make take him down a notch, it's going to be pretty elaborate. Someone's got to go out there with a hippo foot, which I can't imagine is a particularly easy thing to source. It's 1930s. You can't just go on eBay and get a hippo foot. Can you go on eBay and buy a hippo foot? Or just let me just Google that. Taxidermy hippo foot for sale. $300. Really? Can I import that? That'd be kind of cool. Is that legal? <laughs> I'm not really going to do this. This is a weird website. Oh my God. <laughs> what is going on on this website? On the same page... There's like preserved uh, strange moths, a foot peel, what looks like a gherkin with holes in it, and a hippopotamus skull for $985. Holy sh! Is that legal? There's like carved antlers on stuff. Have I accidentally gone onto some dark web hippo selling website? Holy sh! 
That's so strange. Probably the biggest hoax was the surgeon's photograph that appeared in the London Daily Mail on April the 21st, 1934. If you have internet, you've seen it. Yes, this is the most famous one. It's that black and white photo showing the small head on the long neck of a beastie in the lock, clearly taken from a distance. The photograph had been taken by Dr. Robert Kenneth Wilson, who had a London-based practice in general surgery and gynecology. Dr. Wilson had fought in both world wars, where he reached the rank of lieutenant colonel. He was also, sorry, British lieutenant colonel. He was also an expert in fire arms and wrote a definitive text on automatic pistols that had been published in 1934. This, again, people in the past were way more interesting. <laughs> like, they were all like renaissance people. What is he? Well, he's a gynecologist, and he also writes books about automatic pistols, and in his spare time, he fakes photographs. <laughs> okay. It's like, these days, it's like, what do you do? Make videos on YouTube. You don't, uh, dabble in medicine on the side? No, I don't dabble in medicine on the side. <laughs> Not exactly the type of person you'd consider to be guilty of faking monster pictures. As it turns out, the fraud was actually perpetrated by Weatherall. Remember him? Apparently, Weatherall wanted revenge for the footprints debacle. Now, honestly, I'm a little fuzzy on this. Who or what exactly Weatherall blamed for the shot to his reputation and what he hoped to achieve with this entire plot is not clear. Yeah, I don't think it's very likely that the good doctor was the one who got that hippo foot from 1930s dark web and went around the lake making impressions. With his son Ian and stepson Christian Sperling, Weatherall built a model of Nessie, attached it to a toy submarine, and took photos of the monster in the lock. They then somehow managed to convince Dr. Wilson to submit the photo and claimed that it was one he had taken on vacation at the lock. Why the good doctor would have gotten involved in all of this is still unknown. That's so strange. Like, why? Someone's coming to you and it's like, I got this fake photo and you've got a good reputation. How about we use my photo and your good reputation to get this into the press? Why would the person with the good reputation be like, yeah, okay. It'd be like someone coming to me and it's like, Simon, I've got this really good fake evidence that chemtrails are real. You've got a reputation for uh, skepticism and facts. How about you publish this video of chemtrails on your, on your channel? There's no amount of money that could make me do that because if I did that, I'm not gonna have a career afterwards. <laughs> I mean, unless someone was like, we'll give you a billion. If you ever see like, I mean, okay, maybe it'd be less than a billion. <laughs> <laughs> Aim it high! It would have to be so much money that I would never have to work ever again. Even then, I'd feel so dirty, I couldn't do it. No, I couldn't do it. I say that, but then again, a billion? <laughs> uh, chemtrail conspiracy theorists, they don't have that kind of money. They probably don't even have jobs. I'm fired, aren't I? Oh, yes. The whole plot came only to light in 1994 when researchers found a 1975 article in which Ian Weatherall gave up the gig. Wait, who the f**k's Ian Weatherall? Isn't it Marmaduke Weatherall? Oh, it's gotta be his kid or something. By that time, both Weatherall Sr. and Ian were deceased, okay, but the researchers did manage to track down Christian, age 93 at the time, and he confessed to the whole thing. There was no monster, only a toy. But for around 60 years, many people believed that a plesiosaurus was living in the depths of Loch Ness, and in fact, some people still do. They, it's like when the people have come out and said absolutely no it was a fake and people are still like well you're just saying that it's like that uh what's that weird conspiracy with the the, the trump people the super trumpy people q and they're like didn't something come out and it's like he predicted something and then it's like no it didn't happen and everyone's like oh it's a game there's a game it's like the dinosaurs like what the Earth's 6,000 years old. Uh, this is not related to Q, obviously. Sorry, I'm just a bit ADD. And the, the Bible people are like, nah, nah, God put those dinosaur bones there to test us. It's like, holy sh**, really? <laughs> the flipper photo. Taken in 1972, some sources are quick to paint the flipper photo as another hoax, but I'm not convinced. I don't know the flipper photo. Let's look this up. Oh, I'm getting, uh... If I Google flipper photo, you just get images of scuba diving equipment, you know, the feet things, and also spatulas. Flipper photo. Loch Ness. Come on, where's the bloody photo? Show me the bloody photo. Wait, that's it. Ah. Ah. This is just stupid. What is this? It could just be a leaf. If it was Oaks, quite a lot of people with quite a bit to lose in the academic community would have to be in on it. Rather, I think it's more a case of finding what you want to find. Either way, it's an interesting story, so here goes. In 1972, Professor Harold Edgerton of MIT, an expert in high-speed strobe photography, equipped the vessel Narwhal with sonar equipment and a second boat Nan with an underwater camera and attached a strobe light. This was for a combined Academy of Applied Science and Loch Ness Phenomenon Investigation Bureau effort to prove, once and for all, that Nessie existed. The camera 
camera was rigged to take a photo every 45 seconds. Between 1.40 a.m. and 2.10 a.m., the sonar on the narwhal picked up targets that were interpreted to be big animals of some kind. 2,000 photographs were taken and rushed to the U.S. to be developed by Eastman and Kodak under, isn't it Eastman Kodak? I thought that was the company. Anyway, I don't know. Under strictly controlled conditions, three photos came back, two clearly showing a diamond-shaped flipper. Excitement was high. Nessie had been found this time, and there were scientific proof or was there i mean it's very like not clear and it could be many other things other than a flipper it's just a photo it's not a clear photo it's like the photo none of these it's why are there never any clear photos it's more than a coincidence to make a long story short there was some mention of computer enhancement on the photos you know just cleaning up the images it all sounded very scientific so at the time everyone involved with the project accepted that the labs in charge of developing these photos acted in good faith in fact the photos were considered to be so scientific that an official name was proposed by the researchers who had taken the photo they were convinced that a new species of animal had been discovered in the lock and wanted to name it nesoteras romba Terex. Well, they could have chosen something easier to pronounce, couldn't they? There are rumors going around that the proposed name was an anagram for all kinds of things, but I have very little faith in the value of anagrams as secret messages and inside jokes, so I'm just going to skip over that. And immediately I'm looking like, is there an anagram in there? <laughs> a stupid joke. Earlier on, there were some concerns. This was before the surgeon's photo was proved to be a hoax, so there was still some belief that Nessie was a plesiosaurus. However, plesiosaurus never had a diamond-shaped flipper. In fact, the smart people argued that a diamond-shaped flipper would not be an effective means of propulsion, so it's not found on any animal in nature relying on flippers for something. I didn't take the time to compare flippers, so we'll take their word for it. Yeah, I mean, okay. If that's how it is, diamond shaped flip is not very good, fine. Another concern was that the enhanced photos didn't show any pixelation, which would definitely have been present in the 1970s. However, those involved with the project remained firm. Proof of Nessie had been found. <laughs> this isn't proof, my dudes. Finally, researchers and scientists started asking for the original photos without the enhancement. And here is how we know this was not an intentional hoax. Every single researcher asking for the original photos received copies of the original photos. At this point, the hunt started falling apart. The original photos were blurry, grainy, and didn't actually show anything. The enhancement creating the clear, crisp lines of the diamond-shaped flipper was not entirely done by a computer. Rather, some sources claim it was done with a paintbrush. I want to see the original. Oh my, is that the original? Okay. That is clearly nothing. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> That is clearly nothing. The person responsible for this masterpiece has never come forward, and I don't blame them. After all the money and time spent on the endeavor, odds are the culprit would have been tied to a post and sacrificed to whatever monster lived in the lock. <laughs> what? Was this an intentional ice? Hoax, probably not. Someone looked at the photo, sincerely believed they saw a flipper, and simply enhanced it so that everyone else could see what was, according to our Picasso, already there. Nessie. The boring culprits. Ah, yes. Time for us to drift into my favorite place of every video, realism. Plenty of explanations have been put forward to explain what exactly people were seeing out on the lock. So here are a few of the most boring possible explanations from a monster hunting point of view. Mirages. A bathometric survey. Oh, I have no idea what that is. Isn't a bathosphere like a submarine that goes really deep? So maybe it's something like that. In 1904, found that because of depth, Loch Ness is slow to react to temperature changes. This means that distortions and especially elongations of reflections, like say that of a bird, could make the objects seem up to three or four times its actual size. Interestingly enough, when researchers started using sonar, they ran into similar problems with sonar readings. So what appears to be a reflection or sonar reading of a large aquatic animal could simply be a regular or bird or a large large fish. I would wonder what birds would be doing down there. <laughs> It'd be equally weird. Just birds start flying. Well, I guess like ducks. And okay, yeah, there are ducks. I guess they... Uh, whatever. Seals. Another possible case of mistaken identity is seals. Common seals prey on salmon, among other things, and while they are primarily saltwater mammals, they will occasionally enter the lock hunting salmon. In November 1984 to June 1985, scientists kept tabs on a harbor or common seal that lived quite happily in the lock for seven months. There's no real indication that Nessie sightings go up during seal season when the seals come into the lock to chase after fishing boats trawling for salmon. However, visitors to the lock, especially tourists who don't expect to see a seal in fresh water, have mistaken the seals for Nessie. Isn't this it? I mean, look, if these sightings have been going back like hundreds of years, how long did the longest animals live? I don't get that. Maybe 100, 200 years, right? They don't live supers or whales. Oh, wait, isn't there some sort of shark that lives for like hundreds of years? But look, it's really unlikely that it's the same animal. And if there's just one of them, there's got to be two, because they've got to have kids. 
right? So, look, my knowledge of, like, whale biology and is not very good. But it's not gonna be the same animal for hundreds of years. And what I'm basically saying is people just saw different things all over the years. And it's like, oh, how do you explain they're all green? And it's like, well, because loads of shit is green in lakes, isn't it? We discussed this. Many Nessie believers, however, feel that it would be difficult for anyone to mistake a small animal like a seal for an aquatic beast the size of a plesiosaurus. But remember those mirages we talked about? I'd be rather surprised to see a seal three times larger than regular sea in a freshwater lake, so really, can we blame folks for thinking that giant seals might be the Loch Ness Monster? Boats and boat wakes. If you're convinced you're not seeing a mirage or a seal, you could be seeing a boat. <laughs> Look at that monster! Mate, that's a boat. It's clearly a boat. It's making a boat sound. Brrr. Often visitors would only see the wake of a boat and assume that a large creature under the water is creating the wake. An underwater camera in 1960s originally filmed an unidentifiable object. At first, Nessie enthusiasts were convinced that they'd finally captured an image of the elusive monster. But unfortunately, it was just a passing boat. <laughs> I can imagine. It's like, we've done it! We've proven Nessie! Mate, again, that's just a boat. As with the seals, Nessie believers felt that a small fishing or pleasure boat wouldn't leave such a large wake behind it, or that people are unlikely to mistake a boat for a large sea creature. But don't underestimate how dumb people are. But once again, remember the mirage issue. A regular wake left by a small boat could appear much larger when seen from a distance. Mundane objects such as floating logs are often misidentified as Nessie. Other possible culprits are simply creatures you'd expect to find in a lake such as sturgeon, though these are almost extinct now, or catfish, the Wells catfish to be specific. So glad we were specific there. I couldn't have lived with just, just generic catfish. Had to know it was that Wells catfish, and now you know too, you're welcome. These explanations probably cover the majority of the Nessie sightings out there. However, the image of a large catfish really puts a damper on the whole romance of a mysterious monster. So I say, let's get forward to something a little more exciting, shall we? Is Nessie a plesiosaurus? I have to say, we've been talking a lot about plesiosauruses in this whole video. And I didn't say it, but I don't really know what a plesiosaurus is. I guess it's some sort of dinosaur. <laughs> Should we just double check what a plesiosaurus is? Plesiosaurus. I love like with Google, I just absolutely guess how to spell shit, and it always knows what I want. Holy shit, did I get that actually right first time? That's incredible. It's a long-necked marine reptile found as fossils from the late Triassic into the late Cretaceous period. The plesiosaurs extinct thrived during the Jurassic and Cretaceous period. They died out 66 million years ago along with the dinosaurs. <laughs> no. So, uh, sorry to spoil it, but no, Nessie is not a plesiosaurus because they died out 66 million years ago, along with the rest of the dinosaurs. It's kind of a big deal, you might have heard of it. The idea of the Loch Ness Monster being a plesiosaurus probably started with the surgeon's photo that turned out to be a hoax. Most sightings report humps or something big. The long neck and small head don't really come up all that much. While the idea of Nessie being a dinosaur is appealing, it's also really unlikely. Plesiosaurus was a large marine reptile from the early to middle Jurassic period. Why are you telling me this now? I was like, I, I just, because we mentioned Plesiosaurus so many times, I just assumed Ilza was like, everyone knows what a Plesiosaurus is, even small brains people. And now we're getting an explanation about Plesiosaurus. And I just looked it up. That's quite a while ago. Yes, it is. It's noteworthy. I just happened to know it was about 66 million years ago. It's noteworthy for its long neck that was almost about the length of its body and its small head. It had four flippers and a tail that it used for mobility, which is why the notorious flipper photo caused so much excitement. I can't believe scientists actually found this exciting it's like yo yo you work at mit as a biologist i'm assuming you don't know that the dinosaurs died out 66 million years ago what do you think the odds are of a there's a dinosaur living in a scottish lake what do you what do you they're vanishingly small it's much more couldn't it be some more like a modern creature good lord now, as much as I would love for Nessie to be a 65 million year old, uh, 66 million year old reptile, that's very unlikely. No animal could live that long. On top of that, scientists have found out that during the time of the Plesiosaurus, Loch Ness would have been frozen solid, so it would be impossible for any creature to make its way into the loch. <laughs> Die hard Plesiosaurus believers, however, posit another theory time travel. Not really. They agree that it's unlikely for Nessie to be a Plesiosaurus, however, they feel it's entirely possible for the Loch Ness monster to be a creature that evolved from the Plesiosaurus. So perhaps Nessie is a descendant from the Jurassic period, occasionally splashing around the loch to keep the memory of her predecessors alive and well. After all, the Colacanth, considered extinct since the Cretaceous period, made a comeback in 1938. So why not a descendant from a Plesiosaurus? I'd love to know about that Colacanth. That sounds like a fascinating story. I've never heard of that. And of course, there's like descendants of dinosaurs living today. Isn't that crocodile thing? That's like 
part dinosaur or some shit, isn't it? So I'm not saying, but it's also, look, it's not living in a Scottish lake. And if it was, there'd be more than one of them. Or do you think there's a whole, like, plesiosaurus descendant family down there, just not overwhelming the lake with numbers and swimming out into the ocean and breeding and shit? Of course it would. It's an animal. That's what we do. What has been found so far? Let's get back to reality now. There have been plenty of projects and expeditions looking for Nessie. So what exactly has been found? Well, for one thing, Nessie. The Loch Ness Project and Visit Scotland worked with Consberg Maritime to use its Moonin AUV, or Sea Drone, to survey the lake bed. The intention wasn't really to find the Loch Ness Monster, but to simply gather some information about the depths of the loch. To understand what they found, however, we need to go back a little bit. The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes, a 1970s movie on well Sherlock Holmes, was filmed around... This is a change of tack, isn't it? Was filmed around... Drumna Joykit and Zerkwit Castle. In the movie, Nessie makes an appearance. However, the props sank. I bet someone got fired for that, so the Nessie sequences had to be filmed in a studio instead. <laughs> Thanks to Consberg AUV, the 9 meter prop has finally been loca located. Not quite the Nessie we were hoping for, but at least someone found something. Making movies back in the day, even in the 1970s, was so different. It was like, yeah, yeah, we had a model, we actually went to the lock, and now it's like, yeah, well, the, the, the monster's CGI. And the lock's green screen. What do we have? We have a, a little dirty swimming pool that you have to act in. <laughs> like, I feel like maybe it was more fun in the day. You watch those behind the scenes uh, shots of like filming Avengers or latest superhero movie. And it's just like everything just bright green. It's got to be quite hard to act like that, right? Because you're not really on top of a building. You're just standing on a green rug in a green room probably wearing a green costume because soon they'll be like no we don't have costume department we just cgi the costume onto you everyone's just wearing those little balls <laughs> they like acting it's more difficult now <laughs> it's that method actors be like what the fuck is this <laughs> what's his name the guy who won three oscars um god damn he played lincoln daniel day lewis he'd be like absolutely not <laughs> The biggest one for Nessie must be Operation Deep Scan. In 1987, a flotilla of 24 boats equipped with about £1 million worth of sonar equipment did a three-day sweep of the lock. They could still only cover around 60% of the lock's surface, so some areas close to shore were excluded. However, considering the size of Nessie, she probably wouldn't be hiding in the shallower regions close to shore. On the first day, sonar ratings detected three sonar contacts in the waters below Urquhart Castle, the deepest part of the lock. While it couldn't be identified, researchers at the time considered the readings to be indicative of something large. Unfortunately, when returning to the spot on the second and third day, nothing could be found. Apparently, Nessie had moved on. While there was some excitement at the time that Nessie's existence had finally been proven, oh my god, dudes, this is not proof. This is so far from proof. The project leader, Adrian Shine, changed his opinion later, admitting that it could have been a stray seal or a large school of fish. This suggestion is much more plausible. But I like to think that the Loch Ness Monster had simply uh, outwitted believers again in a game of cat and mouse that has been going on for centuries. In 2018, Neil Gemmell, a leader in environmental DNA research, gathered a team calling themselves Loch Ness Hunters and set about using environmental DNA to solve the mystery of Nessie once and for all. Oh, this is so clever. They'll just take a sample of the lake water and see if there's any DNA in it from like unidentified creatures. This guy's a genius. The team consisted of experts of various fields, including marine biology, evolution, archaeology, molecular ecology, and aquatic species. The idea was to collect water samples from the lock and analyze the cellular material in the water. By extracting DNA traces, the team would be able to determine what species could be found in the lock. All in all, 250 samples were collected. The results published in 2019 identified 3,000 different species in the lock. Many of these species were found at a microscopic level, but bigger species were also identified, including 11 fish species, 20 mammals, and 3 amphibians. However, one thing was missing. Reptile DNA. So if Nessie exists, she most certainly is not a dinosaur. Fucking love it when that science comes through. Mwah! What they did find in abundance were eels. So, is Nessie a very large eel? Gemmell is not convinced. While it's certainly possible that there are some unnaturally large eels in the lock, he doesn't think there would be enough food in the lock to sustain a population of oversized eels. Personally, I wouldn't mind if Nessie is not an eel. Eels are not exactly cuddly creatures, and I can't imagine plushy eels would sell particularly well. My kid's got a plushy snake, <laughs> and it's got a... <laughs> It's really weird. My wife and I always make this joke. It's like, I think it was a gift, but it's this really long snake, and it's brightly colored, and it's soft and nice. But I'm like, one, snake is a weird thing to have as a soft toy or a plushie. 
I think they, is that an American thing? I know you have a different word for them, Americans. But also, it's got like a measure on it. And it's like, you know, 10 centimeters, 20 centimeters on it. And I'm like, I know it's for measuring how big the kid is. But also, there's that, there's that urban legend about that woman who's got the snake, right? And she lets the snake sleep in the bed with her. And every night she goes to bed and the snake slithers up into the bed and it lies alongside her and it stretches all the way out. And the woman's just like sleeping and she thinks, oh, it's so nice how much my snake night likes me. And then she hears that, um, or she reads somewhere that the snake doesn't like her. The snake is just measuring her to see if he can fit, if she can fit inside him, like when he eats her. And all I look at when I see that plush toy with the <laughs> the measure on the side, I'm like, it just reminds me of a snake just measuring up a baby to be eaten. And I'm like, what's wrong with me? And I told my wife this, and now and she was like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> of course, as with all scientific studies, there are limitations and doubts, leaving a few big holes big enough for a mythical monster to squeeze through. DNA breaks down in water over seven days, so while the study was extensive, migratory animals like seals and some fish species that are known to visit the lock but weren't present in the water for seven days would not be detected. If Nessie had gone to visit a cousin in Loch Mara, then no trace of her would be found. There is also the fact that around 20% of the DNA collected didn't match any known species. It's like, yeah, but they can, of course, there's going to be like unknown species. It's a big ass lock and we're discovering stuff at the bottom. Well, it's still a lake, though. God, DNA, like finding out about, about new species that way. That's such a crazy thing. Go, go take a sample of the ocean and be like, I discovered like seven new animals. Have we found them? No, I know they're unique because I got their DNA. You just discover so many animals that way. That's so crazy. This is such a genius thing. This is my favorite thing from the, I've learned from this video so far. Genius. Let's do this. The scientists, of course, explain this way with words like incomplete sequences, missing strands, and anomalies, which we all know is code for Bigfoot, Loch Ness Monster, and aliens. Yes, yeah, stupid scientists with their words just designed to obfuscate us. Is that how you use obfuscate? Obfuscate? Like to uh, conceal from us with information, like false information or whatever. Non-monsters. So this bit isn't so much about the monster, but about Operation Groundtooth, run by the Loch Ness Project, to find out more about the lock itself. While they've not had an encounter with Nessie yet, they have found quite a few interesting remnants from days past. The Pansy On August the 3rd, 2002, Operation Ground Truth discovered the intact wreck of the Pansy, an 80-foot, that's around 24-meter, Zulu-class sailing fishing ship near Foyers. She had originally been built in 1903 and in 1909 was one of the first bo boats to be fitted with an auxiliary motor. Unfortunately, there's no record of when or why she sank, but she was afloat until at least 1911 when a photo was taken of the owner and his crew on board the vessel, the Crusader. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I must have, like, phased out when we said this isn't about Nessie, it's just about interesting shit found in the lake, okay. <laughs> they were like, Simon, you know you read that out loud, it's like, yeah, I wasn't paying attention. I was actually thinking I recently got a canoe. This is so random. Like, sometimes I'll just be reading something and I'll just be thinking about something else. Like, I was reading that out loud. It probably looked like I understood it. And I was thinking about this canoe that I recently bought and how much I'm looking forward to taking it on the river, hopefully this weekend. What's wrong with me? In 1952, John Cobb brought his jet-powered crusader to Loch Ness. He held the land speed record of 390 miles per hour and planned to attempt a water speed record as well. On did, is this, did this guy crash? I feel like I've heard of this. On September 29th, Cobb made his first attempt. Sadly, while traveling at about 200 miles per hour, 320 kilometers an hour, the cruise that is bloody quick. The Crusader hit an unexpected boat wake and disintegrated, killing Cobb, whose body was later recovered. On July the 5th, 2002, the remains of the Crusader were finally found, lying peacefully under 200 meters of water. Oh my god, that is going to be that's a. <laughs> You're doing a, a water speed record. Be like, how about we get all the boats? off the water that day so it's really nice and flat because we know a little wave <laughs> disintegrates our boat it's going really fast the wellington bomber on new year's eve 1940 a world war ii wellington bomber n2980 ditched into the lock after experiencing engine failure the six trainee navigators on board had been ordered to eject by parachute, leaving only the two pilots on board. Unfortunately, rear gunner Sergeant Fensom died when his parachute didn't open, but the rest of the crew landed safely. After surviving the crash into the lock, the pilots paddled ashore in their inflatable dinghy. Wow, I bet that guy who parachuted out was like, oh, for fuck's sake, I should have stayed on the bloody aircraft. Doing the only reasonable thing to do under the circumstance, I mean, of course he didn't think they was dead. The pilots uh, then got a ride from a lorry to Inverness to join in the New Year celebrations. Why the search for Nessie? We've looked at the stories, the hunts, and the discoveries, but one question remains. Why? 
Why do we keep looking for a monster that by all scientific reasoning probably doesn't exist? A study in the- Because people are crazy. <laughs> study in the 1990s determined that there was simply not enough food in the loch to support a large mammal. DNA testing of the water concluded that there are no reptiles or big mammals in the loch. And yet, despite this, the Loch Ness Monster was spotted 16 times in 2021, the highest number of sightings since Ness's golden age in the 60s and 70s. It seems like humankind is determined to find something in the loch. I'm no philosopher or psychologist, but as I look at the world around around me and see so many changes, some good, some bad, and some downright terrifying, Nessie remains constant, a mysterious monster guarding us from the depths of her watery home. <laughs> Isn't that, she's not guarding us. What's she doing? Keeping us safe from all those devils from the center of the earth coming up through Loch Ness? Sounds like a hell of a movie though, doesn't it? Maybe directed by that same guy who made Moonfall. <laughs> I talk about how cra- Nah, I was on another channel. That movie is full on crazy. Conclusion. And so the hunt for Nessie continues, and not just among tourists. An article from the Smithsonian states the Loch Ness Monster was one topic that they get asked about the most. And while there is no proof and there is no monster specialist on staff, they're willing to keep an open mind until existence is disproven or proven beyond a doubt. As for the Scottish economy, Nessie might, might be the most profitable export. The Loch Ness Monster adds about £40 million to the Scottish coffers every year. She may not be proven, but she sure is profitable. So, is the Loch Ness Monster real? I have a better question for you. Does it matter? In a world with technology and science where almost everything could be propped under a mic popped under a microscope or examined away explained away in one way or another, we need Bigfoot and Nessie to remind us that once upon a time the world was innocent and magic was real. I'm such a dickhead, because I'm like, but it's not real though, is it? Obviously. <laughs> Oh, Simon, why would you make this channel? It just makes you look like a dick. Uh, this has been Decoding the Unknown. Thank you so much for watching. Feel free to leave a review. Two stars. Entertaining at points. Writers have good points. Simon's a bell. That, uh, a review would be great. Though, seriously, it helps this podcast get in front of more people. If you're listening as a podcast, of course, this is also available on YouTube. If you're watching, hello there. Um, and in that case, a like, a uh, subscribe, a comment. All very welcome. And I'll see you next time.